I prefer the hydrogenic bias because that's the end result of the journey. We think about a guy standing at the window, an AK-47, you know, and the statement by any means necessary. Or a person who was a criminal and then he ended up in that part of his life as a saint. But one thing unique about Malcolm X is that he belongs to everybody, to everyone. He belongs to the civil rights movement, he belongs to the human rights, the militancy that existed in the 50s, the Panthers, the Afrocentric revolution and identity search, just social justice, he belonged to everyone. And he was a leader, he was a scholar, he was a teacher, he was a father, he was a husband, he was a brother, he was all the above. But somewhere along the line, we lose the humanity of El Haji Mishabat. Who was this person? What evolved or what caused him to evolve until the final stages of his life? You see, when we look at an accomplishment as such, it's phenomenal. Because he was not a person of education, he was not a person of college. He started from the, from the bottom. His life started from the bottom. He was born in Omaha, Nebraska, to uh, Louise Helen, who actually was from the Caribbean. And his father was Earl Little. Anyone here visit Omaha, Nebraska, just raise your hand. Okay. You know, when you look at the skyline, you know, you don't think about the dark undercurrents of negativity that existed in that society. In 1919, uh, there was a public burning in o Omaha, Nebraska. A gentleman by the name of Willie Brown, who was accused of raping, raping a white girl, a white lady. He was jailed, the mob, they broke, took him from the jail, they had a public lynching, and they burned him on the stage. This is the mind state that existed in Omaha, Nebraska during the time of the birth of Malcolm X. And remind you, this is the experience of the early years of Malcolm X. So you have to understand how he began, so you understand his mind state. So this was the early stages. In Lansing, Michigan, another group called the Black Legions, who was another uh, pseudo clans group, burned their house. I think uh, he was about five years at that five years old at that time. And the following year, he was killed. His father, Malcolm's father, Earl Little, was killed by a trolley car. They said it was an accident. One insurance company refused to pay out the life policy because they said he committed suicide. And the lesser claim paid out $1,000 at $83 a month. So they was very, very impoverished from the loss of their father. And as time unfolded in 1939, his mother was committed to a state mental institution. In 1939, shortly a few years after the death of his father, because she refused to allow her children to be indoctrinated by the system at that time. And not being in compliance with the system that was established, you were deemed insane. So she was committed to a, a mental institution. And she was also raped and she had the baby. So this is the type of trauma that Malcolm was going through in his early years. And when she went into the mental institution, he ended up in a juvenile foster home. So when he became 13, uh, he was in class and he was questioned as to what was his, his aspirations or his dreams in the future. He said, you know, he wanted to be a lawyer. And his teacher said that wasn't a practice. 
practical career for a Negro. You know, coming out of the country, he wanted to go to New York. And eventually he went to New York and, you know, as a young man, he got the jobs as a, you know, working in the, the nightclubs and, you know, restaurants and things of this nature. And he eventually got in trouble. Like, usually young, young, young people don't have that oversight, that guidance, things of this nature. He got in trouble. So he was sentenced to three months, suspended for one year parole. So he returned back to uh, Boston and he finished his parole. And I'm sure that he had some unfinished business in New York. So he did return. But this time it wasn't so pleasant. He was convicted of burglary, larceny, and all the above, and also uh, possession of a weapon, which was actually the knife he used to pick the door. It was charged with the weapon. And he was sentenced from to eight to 10 years in prison. And this was the turning point of Malcolm X. You know, when he, got into the prison, you know, he was very angry. But he came across, you know, uh, a group of people that were there from the nation this time. You know, a very organized, disciplined body of people, you know, who was against all the things that, that was for the demise of human dignity, whether it was physically, mentally, etc. And over a period of years, he began to give ear to their doctrine, to their teachings, and eventually he embraced. You see, Malcolm wasn't your ordinary person. He began to study, he began to educate himself, it was to continue to eradicate social injustice. And he made the sacred journey to Mecca. In 1964, he made the pilgrimage. He entered into a dimension, a world that he never knew about. A world that had been kept a secret from him. Door was closed. And you can read his letters of his confession to true Islam. He was amazed to see Europeans and Africans and Asians sitting and sharing the same dish of food, drinking from the same vessel with no sense of discrimination. This was unheard of in this society at that time. I can remember not even being permitted to go inside of a restaurant that was owned by Anglo-Americans. I can recall going to the theater where we had to go upstairs in a segregated a, co a compartment of the theater to watch the movies. Schools were segregated, everything. And what he experienced there was something that was unheard of in this society. It was an experience that changed his whole perception of mankind. At that point, he became a moral physician and a humanitarian. And he understood the plight was, and, and, and the struggle was not just isolated to the people in America. And he began to travel. He went to Egypt, places like that. And when he came back, he came back at Hajj al Shabazz. This is when he changed his name. And something unique happened when he was in Saudi Arabia for the Hajj. He said, I don't know if you've seen this picture, this historic picture of him sitting with King Faisal. But at that time, it was Prince Faisal in 1964. And slavery, that's the same year that slavery or were, was abolished in Saudi Arabia. Slavery was, was legal in Saudi Arabia. It, was it wasn't chattel slavery as the West, you know, Western slavery, but it was a form of slavery that was abolished in 1964 by Prince Faisal. You know, and, they, and, and this is some of the dialogue that Prince Faisal and Malcolm X had concerning the equality of his citizens. But him leaving the nation of Islam created a rift 